Um, our third sessions are going to be on the first epistle of John. The first epistle of John is one of the most amazing little epistles because packed into it is an enormous amount of information that is amazingly relevant to us. Back in AD 90, John the aged apostle, the last of the apostles, takes up his pen to write this profound and amazing and encouraging epistle to brethren and sisters. Brethren and sisters he dearly loves. Brethren and sisters that are going through enormous turmoil. They're going through enormous turmoil, brethren and sisters, because there is erupting error on every side. What are they going to do about it? How are they going to cope with this? How are they going to live a godly life despite all the turmoil and trouble? And John doesn't give them a statement that this is exactly how you've got to do it. John gives them statements that are full of emotion but are full of intuitive logic. So what we find in the epistle, the first epistle of John is that we have what appears to be a bit like the Proverbs. Some discreet and beautiful thoughts, but in fact they're actually amazingly structured. We have some remarkable contrasts. Things like, as you can see on the screen, chapter 2, verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. He that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness. So we've got absolute black and white, haven't we? Light and darkness. And that's very characteristic of the way John writes. And as we said, the reasoning is intuitive, which means we've really got to get onto John's wavelength. We've really got to get our minds into how he's thinking to be able to understand what he's telling us. Otherwise, it'll just sound like nice, lovely words, and we won't actually get to grips with what he's telling us. So, for example, chapter 4, verse 7. Love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. Sounds good, doesn't it? What's the logic behind it? Well, if love is of God and can come from nowhere else... Then if someone loves, as in agape love, where have they got it from? Only one place, from God, isn't it? And so therefore, someone who manifests agape love must be born of God, because they can't get it from anywhere else. But you see the intuitive line of, of thinking that you've got to tune into. Another distinct thing about this first epistle of John is that there's no salutation. He doesn't say it's from John to such and such an ecclesial group. There's no greetings, no personal references. There's no quoting of scripture. He doesn't say, now, if we go back to the book of the Psalms, it says this or that. He doesn't say that at all. You've got to recognise the words that he's quoting as to where they're from. He doesn't tell you. And he draws very heavily on the Gospel of John. In fact, really, what we've got in 1 John is, if you like, an appendix to um, the Gospel of John. There are over 200 allusions and um, I'm sure some of you that have done this study before will be aware that perhaps there's even more than that. And that's quite a remarkable number in just five chapters, isn't it? So here's just some, some simple comparisons. There's only a few. The beginning of the epistle is that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have handled, that which is the word of life. Well, that's so similar, isn't it, to the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Remarkable. So in our appreciation of what the gospel, sorry, the epistle, the first epistle of John is telling us, we've got to constantly have in our minds what John has written about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in his gospel. Brother Carter said these words about this first epistle. The writings of John, and he's including uh, all of John's writings, the beloved disciple, contain some of the simplest language and some of the profoundest thoughts. And it's true. You look through the writings of John, there are no big words. There are no complicated structures of grammar. It's actually very simple language. And yet, profound thoughts are there. As Brother Carter goes on to say, where else can we read a statement expressed in monosyllables which yet calls for such continued application of thought to understand it. That's true. Many times, for those of us who've studied 1 John, you look at a, a verse and you think, well, that's good. Let's think about that a bit further. And you can probably think for a couple of hours about just one verse and what it's meaning. 
It is a remarkable epistle. Now, as we said, this is an epistle born out of time of ecclesial trouble. Very appropriate, then, to our theme here, striving to keep the truth in challenging days, because we're in challenging days. It was a time of great ecclesial trouble. John is writing to the uh, ecclesias around the area of Ephesus, and there's errorists, many antichrists, chapter 2, verse 18, many false prophets, chapter 4, verse 1. An ecclesial split has happened, and we'll explore this a bit more tomorrow morning. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out. So imagine the situation. A significant proportion of the ecclesia has got up and walked out the back door. We're having nothing more to do with you. Imagine how those that are left feel. This is what John is dealing with. And those that have left, ah, they're still determined to have an influence. So John says, I write unto you concerning them that seduce you. So these people that are left are still trying to pick off the members that are back in the ecclesia. And uh, I think as uh, Brother Purse Mansfield says, most perceptively in his um, commentary on 1 John, he says, John wrote to counter the influence of a so-called higher form of knowledge, and we'll explore that tomorrow morning as well, that challenged the foundations of faith. The peril came not from men who were out to destroy the truth, but from those who thought they were improving it and whose aim was to make it intellectually respectable. It is significant that there is a tendency to the same end today against we, which we must be on our guard. And Uncle Purse was exactly right and even more right for the days in which we live. We face a very significant challenge, and this is only one of many in the truth, isn't it? And I'm sure you're aware of, of theistic evolution. I want to read to you a letter that, if you haven't read this before, this was uh, penned just last month. It's only a month old. This was a letter to the Testimony magazine, to the Christadelphian magazine, to the Lampstand, and to some other magazines. I don't know whether you can read the text there. It says... Dear brethren, this letter has been motivated by the biblical principles of unity with those who hold the same understanding of the gospel and atonement as we do, and forbearance of those who differ on biblical details which can be legit legitimately be identified as matters of conscience. Sounds good, doesn't it? Till we get to the next paragraph. The undersigned are not all committed to the theory of evolution, but we are genuinely concerned for the unity of the brotherhood and believe that the current treatment of the issue of evolution in our community is divisive and destructive. Faithful brothers and sisters are being charged falsely with beliefs they do not hold, and unilateral disfellowship is being encouraged as a way of responding to those who accept evolution and those who are willing to accommodate them. This letter was signed by 30 brethren and sisters. It also goes on to say there was another 40 who agreed with it but were not prepared to sign it. What this letter is appealing for, brethren, sisters and young people, is for a tolerance of evolution, of theistic evolution. And this is having significant inroads into various parts of the Brotherhood. Four years ago, there was a very similar letter written in 2010 it was written to the editor of the Christadelphian magazine saying virtually the same thing signed by eight brethren and sisters now this letter represents 70 brethren and sisters and that's happened in four years this is spreading and if you happen to be familiar with what's happening in Melbourne you will know that it's causing enormous pain. The problem doesn't come down so much to those that believe theistic evolution. The problem comes down to those who don't want to be out of fellowship with those that do believe theistic evolution. And so it's going to be tolerated. That's what they want. Now, I'm saying this, brethren and sisters, not to 
go through theistic evolution, although we'll have a look at a little bit of it in our fourth study. But more to say that the problems that John was facing and dealt with in 1 John are exactly the same sort of problems we've got here, where there's an enlightened group who think that they're actually going to improve the truth, but really what they're doing is sowing enormous seeds of error. Now, another very interesting thing in 1 John is the confronting statements that we have in 1 John. What John says really makes us think, brethren and sisters, and it's good for us. It really makes us analyse where we are in the truth. And that is good, isn't it? Just a few of these confronting statements, because there's lots of them, as I'm sure you're aware when you read 1 John in the readings. If we say that we have fellowship with him, that is God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. It's a strong statement, isn't it? Chapter 2, verse 9. He that hateth his brother is in darkness. The exact opposite of light. In other words, you've got no hope at all. You're finished. If you hate your brother, that's it. You might as well pack up and go home. You're not going to be in the kingdom, is what John says. Doesn't that make us think about ourselves? Chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen God, neither known him. But hang on, don't we all sin? What's he saying? Well, we'll explore this, and it's not nearly so, so troublesome as it might first appear. Chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Again, a challenging statement. If, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. This is very straight stuff, isn't it, brethren and sisters? But coupled with this, there is some lovely comforting thoughts that are right through this wonderful epistle, sometimes called the epistle of love, because there is so much about the love of our God towards us and about how we should love one another. Chapter 1, verse 6, The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Chapter 2, verse 3, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What's so comforting about that? Well, you know, in Matthew 7, it talks about the fact of those being rejected, where Christ said to them, I never knew you. We wouldn't want that said of us, would we? When we stand before the judgment seat, I never knew you. That fills us with cold terror. So how do we make sure that we know God? How do we really know that we know him? Better to find out now than later, isn't it? How do we know? John gives us the comfort. If we keep his commandments, we actually know him. We really do know him. Chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That is confidence. Chapter 5, verse 4. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And to me, some of the, the most wonderful thoughts that the Apostle John gives us of encouragement are in chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now. And it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. Now you can meditate for hours about what it means to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. We shall be like him, made like him. What does that mean in terms of our hearts and our minds? It's a wonderful opportunity for great meditation. So this is what we're going to be looking at in 1 John in our, in our studies, brethren and sisters. What can this study do for us? Several things. Of course, we can better understand this stirring and profound epistle. It can help us to keep the truth in challenging days, just like the Apostle John was saying to his audience, to uphold the truth in very challenging days. It helps us to manifest godliness despite troublous times. Because it is so hard, isn't it? When there is trouble and there's contention and people are saying awful things against you, it's very easy to react in kind. And that is wrong. We've got to always manifest the character of our God at all times. And also to review our own discipleship, to look into our hearts, to look into our motives, to look at our appreciation of what our Lord has really done for us. 
to think about how much we really love our brethren and sisters or are there some that we don't actually not love, it's just that we don't really love them, if you know what I mean. And how much do we actually love the world or the things of the world? That, as as I'm sure you're aware, is one of the greatest issues facing our brotherhood, isn't it? People being engulfed with all the things of the world. And, And many of them aren't bad things. It's just that they take so much time. Material possessions that we can enjoy. Many of them aren't bad. But if they take our time away from God, then that's not good, is it? And also, to energise our vision of the joy of the kingdom... And that truly is a really thrilling thing. So, brethren and sisters, I hope that you will enjoy our studies in the first epistle of John. If there's any comments you want to make to me, any suggestions, please do so, because we're not going to be able to cover all of First John in any sort of detail. And if there's points that you think that I should be making, then please say them to me, and I hope that we can have some great discussions together around this really remarkable epistle. Thank you.